All right. Better picture, too, I think. What do you guys think? There's no chair. I love that cool chair. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> where were we? Yes. Uh, so far, so good. Now, let's see. We were just about to make a new presentation, but apparently it's gone. Oh, there it is. OK, so this is our new presentation right there. Uh, and we talked about these little toolies down here and stuff like that. Uh, up here, the tab has different kinds of things. Uh, I'll talk about that. There's actually a bug I'm sure you all noticed in Microsoft where sometimes it messed, messes up the tabbing. So I'll show you that as well, I think. Uh, now, what I wanted to do first was to talk about outlines. Now, over here, over here in this, this area, which is the thumbnail area, it actually lets you change between two different views. That's what these guys are about up here. So this is thumbnail view, but next to it is outline view. Da -da -da -da. And that's what we want to do. We want to go into outline mode. Boop. <gasps> Look at that. For some reason, it changes the, the icons up here, but as well. Anyway, so now we're in outline mode. And basically, over here, it'll show you all your slides done as outlines. Uh, so it'll be all the text on them. And what I'm going to do here is I'll just show you how you can quickly create a presentation by playing around in this outline mode. So let's say I want to do something on memory for advertising. So you can see as I'm typing over here, it's also creating the slide over here on the fly, which is kind of cool. Uh, I'll hit return. So now we're on the next slide. So let's say the next slide will be background. Then we want to talk about mm, previous studies, something like that. And then we want to talk about uh, methods. Let's say, well, let's say our question, maybe our question. And then something about methods, and then something about results. And as I'm doing this, you can see I'm pretty quickly creating a little slideshow. Results, what comes after results? Maybe discussion, future directions, and that's about it. Okay, now that was pretty straightforward. Another thing I should have mentioned is as you're typing this, whenever you hit a return, it thinks you want to make a new slide, but if you do a tab, it means you want to add some subtext to that slide. So I do a tab here, I'll put my name, James Intrilligator, return. I don't need to tab anymore because I'm sort of already indented a bit. And I can say supervisor is, I don't know, God, something like that. Um, <laughs> No, that's stupid. Supervisor is brain. Ooh, brain. Um, background. So now I come down here and I hit a return. And again, it thinks I want to make a new slide, but I'm going to tab and say, uh, let's see, what did I say? It was memory for advertising. Adverts are everywhere. Something like that. Uh, adverts are fun, etc., etc. Previous studies, um, we could say that they were in maybe lab based and real world. And under lab-based, if you hit a return, again, it thinks I want to do it, but if I do a tab, boom, I'm inside. So I could say it was for, let's say, liking of adverts, memory of adverts, things like that. And real world, again, if I hit a return, it thinks I want to make a new bullet, but instead I'm going to do a tab again, and I'm going to be inside to add subtext. Does that make sense? It's kind of how outlines usually work. The other thing you might want to know is that if you do a shift tab, it's an out dent. I don't know if you care about that. So like if I decide I actually want it to be a new slide here, boom. Um, Let's say uh, examples, something like that. I do the shift tab to get back out. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. All right, does that make sense? So by doing that, I've pretty quickly thrown together a little uh, thing. Our question is, um, let's say, does Facebook adver advertising follow the same rules? Follow the same rules. That's our real question. And methods were people came and did stuff. Nice. <laughs> Results, totally awesome. <laughs> totally awesome. Discussion, etc. Okay, so uh, it's a bit ridiculous, but in less than five minutes, I've actually put together the outline of it. Now, I was in outline mode, like I said up here, but if I wanted to, I can go back to thumbnail view, and you could see that actually it's created all these little slides for me. Doot, doot, doot. Uh oh, examples. I don't have examples. We'll get to that in a second. All right, any questions about how to use outline mode to make a quick presentation? It's pretty. Pretty nice way to actually get the basic structure there in place. And it makes it much easier to then drop additional elements in. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you was outline mode. The next thing I wanted to show you was, uh, well, uh, actually, first I'll just, I mean, it's, again, it's kind of the basics of PowerPoint. You probably know all this stuff already. But when I made this slide, for examples, it thinks I'm going to add text here. But maybe I don't want any text. And it's kind of annoying. What you need to do is click this box, not that box, but this box. And you can just delete it. Delete! Gone. Now examples, you know, now you can go over here and we'll search in Google. We'll look for uh, cool advertisements. Cool advertisements. Images for cool advertisements. Boom. Oh yeah, that's cool. 
And you can just copy that. Copy image, go over here, paste it in. Look at that cat. Cat. What is that? <laughs> um, that's, uh, this is great. That's a nice one. How did that become the like top three for cool advertisements? All right, so we'll put a couple of them here. I'm just doing this so that later I can show you some other stuff. Background, again, I would recommend in, uh, let's say, millions of advertisements. So in background, we're going to say something about, oh, that's not very good. Huh. Interesting. I expected lots. Let's try lots of advertisements. Ah, there we go. That's good. So we'll copy that image. We'll paste that over here and boop, adverts are everywhere. Maybe to set the mood, kind of had these little pictures on the side. You can do whatever you can to try to make it look actually like you cared and spent time on your presentation, right? So yes, you could have the same content without having all these little pictures on the side, but having them there will make it look more professional, more kind of engaging, enjoyable, and it'll look like you spent time on it and cared about it. And that is halfway to the A star. <laughs> well, not really, but uh, you know, form and content, they both are required, I would say, for a good presentation. And in this particular case where you only have 10 minutes Everyone's going to have pretty good content, I think. Everyone knows that they have to have an introduction, a method, etc. So the way you can kind of set yourself apart and become memorable and different is to have some nice kind of form, have some nice factors there, some nice animations, little things like that. Uh, and again, so let me show you now. The one easiest way to make all of that happen is to use what are called themes. And that was the next thing I was said I would talk about. So that's how to use outline mode to quickly put stuff together and to steal images from Google. <laughs> uh, you may want to consider putting attributions to the images, but I don't know. I say no. <gasps> Radical. Um, depends on the consumption, but I say no. All right, so let's say now I've made this presentation, but it's pretty boring actually, right? I mean, it's just black on white, which is not bad. Kind of a cool, you know, clean web 2.0 look. I don't know. Uh, but maybe you want to change it. So what you could do now is you can go into themes, themes, and in here you could choose one of the built-in themes. Again, you probably all have used themes before, but I'll just show you, remind you how it works. So lots of different themes to choose from. All of these are different themes that you could choose and maybe you want to choose one that kind of has the look and feel of your topic area or maybe you don't. Sometimes it's exciting to have something totally different like if you're talking about you know death maybe you want happy themes but maybe not. Uh, so a lot of these are standards and you could just click them. I should have shown you. So as, as I'm going through them I could click them all. Oh that's kind of cool. Ooh memory for advertising. That looks awesome. I'm gonna go with that. Well maybe not. That's not bad. Oh, I used that just recently for a pitch in London. And I got money, yay! Anyway, but so use that one now. Oh, that's kind of interesting. International, if it's about international advertising, maybe that'd be good. I claimed I was going to talk about Facebooky stuff, so we could do something Facebooky. Eh, I liked that one, this one. That was exciting. Whoa, look at that. Whoa! All kinds of phallic things going on. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, we'll use that one. So now the cool thing is now I'm just going to go into slideshow mode. Slideshow, boom, there they are, the big phalli coming in. Memory for advertising, boom, background. Look at that, wow. It looks like I actually cared. Whoa, there they are. Oh, that doesn't work. That didn't work too well. We'll have to fix that. Um, so, so far so good. Oh yeah, Facebook, it's perfect. Wow, <laughs> color scheme is right and everything. I better get a Facebook logo in there, right? Facebook, we'll go over here. Uh, Facebook. Facebook logo, wow, second most common search. Facebook like, well, that's a good one, we'll copy that. Put, put over here, Facebook, Facebook, ding, something like that. All right, so pretty quick way to kind of make it look like it's been designed, like you care about it. Now, that's themes. Now themes, basically, they will do everything for you. They'll change all your fonts, all your backgrounds. Personally, I, I don't like, it's again, it's a question of style, but I don't like it when they take the text for the title of the slide and make it take up sort of a third of the slide or whatever, a quarter of the slide. Uh, and here it got in the way. I don't like that. It's not bad though. You could, I, I don't actually care that much, I must say, but um, it's a good way to, sh to demonstrate what the slide master is all about. So that's all themes. That was the next thing I said I would talk about themes and layouts. Uh, I should mention, so yeah, you could try out different themes, just see which one looks good. In theory, you used to be able to quite easily, there was a button here that let you go online and download more themes. You can go online and find thousands of themes by category, like science-y, you know, whatever it is. I couldn't find how to easily do that. I spent a little bit of time last night. It must not be that hard, but I, I gave up. So anyway, in theory, if you, if you don't like any of the themes here, you can go online and find others. You can download them and load them into here, and it should work. Um, 
yeah, so there are these different theme options as well, which I haven't really played with, but if you want to change a different, if you want to go for a different color scheme, boom, it just does it to every single slide. So it's kind of cool. It lets you pretty easily change everything. I liked the Facebooky, fun, cartoony one. Backgrounds, you can make different backgrounds. You know, maybe you don't like this kind of noisy, pixelated thing. You could choose a different one. Uh, but the other thing is, the next thing I want to talk about is the slide master. So if you go to view and you say you want to view master, and which master? I want to view the slide master. Bum, ba, da, bum. There it is, the slide master. Uh, and the slide master is kind of cool. It lets you change something so that it appears on every slide or change the theme of every slide. Like, for instance, if you decide you don't like, uh, where were we? If you don't like something about the fonts, you could change it here on the master and it'll change the fonts on every single slide. So the master is basically the formats that all the slides will follow. I don't actually use it to do that. The only thing I tend to use on here is I, I would put like my name or something at the bottom of every slide. So if you want to put uh, copyright James Intrilligator 2013, let's say. Again, for this, it doesn't matter too much, but you may want to have your name at the bottom of every slide, maybe your PSU or whatever it is, just so that the marker knows who you are and they can ask you questions and remember your brilliant presentation. Uh, so I've put my name down there, but black on white, on blue, come on. So I have to change the color of that. In theory, you can do that. I don't remember how. Format. Well, here we go. Color. Let's go to white. White. Ooh, that's posh. And maybe I'll do italics. And now I'm done. I think this will work. Close master is up here, by the way. It's always a pain. Every time they make a new Microsoft PowerPoint, they change where that is. But anyway, to get out of it, you have to be sure to close master. Boom. And now you'll see on every single slide, it has that little James Atrilliator at the bottom. So anyway, any questions about any of that yet? So you could use the slide master to change the font of every slide, the add something to the bottom of every slide, etc. All right. So that's the slide master. What did I want to say about that? That's it for slide master. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about were, was transitions. Okay. Now transitions again. You probably don't want to do too much transitioning. You could. It's again up to you. If your if your topic if it makes sense, like if you wanted to have, if you're talking about sort of dynamic advertising, maybe you do want your transitions to be dynamic, right? But if it's something kind of just straightforward, EEG or ERP, maybe you want to do some kind of cool brain transition at some point or another, but use them sparingly. But let's say, let's say maybe you want to wake people up. So the memory for advertising, so the first one will have a cool transition and it's pretty straightforward. You just go to slideshow and you choose transitions. And up here, again, kind of like the themes, it's up here where you get to set what transition you want to do. And the latest version of PowerPoint actually does have a lot of cool transitions. And it's, again, the same kind of thing where you can try them out and see which look you want to go for. Random bars. Oh, look at that. That was kind of cool. Reveal. Ooh. Oh, that was just seasickening. Um, flash. Boom. Look at that. Background. That'll wake them up. Checkerboard. Ooh. A little slow. Dissolve. Eh. Pixelated. Oh, ripple. Phew. Oh, that'll do it. Honeycomb. Oh, my God. Well, that was a bit insane. But anyway, there's lots of them. Shred. I like shred. There you go. Vortex. Oh, that's the stuff. Well, any preferences or should I just choose one randomly? Gallery. What's this? Ooh. Ooh. Kind of a wannabe Prezi look. All right. So doors... Whoa. All right. Ferris wheel. I haven't seen that one. Sorry. <laughs> Whee! Oh, that was stupid. Um, fly through. <laughs> nah. Orbit? No, 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 no. I like, I'm going to go for the honeycomb just to show you something else. So honeycomb would be annoying if you had to do every slide like that, right? But let's stick with that for a second because you can actually change, so let's say we're going to use honeycomb, you can actually change things over here about the effect. Now this effect does not have very many options. If, if it did, like if I chose ripple, woo, oh it also, oh no it does have some options. So in here, what kind of ripple do you want? Oh, let's try from top right. Oh now, that's cool. Yeah, I still like honeycomb. Honeycomb is kind of cool. You could have a sound if you wanted to drive your marker crazy, but let's not do that. But we let's I don't like how long it takes, so you can just change the duration up here. Let's say we want a super fast honeycombing. We'll just take one second honeycomb. Not even sure that they saw what they think they saw. So let's see if that's gonna work. Uh, we'll go here, first slide. I'll start the slideshow. Boom! Boom! Whoa! 
All right, well, that was kind of cool. It's still not fast enough. I just wanna, I'm just curious if it'll actually do this, point one. All right, one quick last experiment. Boom, get ready. Ready for everything, whoa. All right, well, that, it loses all integrity, so that's no good. Anyway, you get the idea. I just wanted to, to demonstrate, you can, you can change these kind of effects a lot. Some of them have cool effect options, like I think shred, you could say how shredded you wanted, like particles in, oh, let's try that. Ooh, oh, that's cool. I don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. So you could change, play around with those different transitions and use it. But again, uh, and you could also, by the way, set it for, you could tell it when you want it to advance the slide. In general, you want to do it by mouse click. You don't want to risk running the timer on yourself, I think. Um, you could also, if you wanted to, if you decide you love your honeycomb transition or your shred, vortex, let's try vortex one more time. Vortex, uh, and I want to do a vortex from the bottom. Whoa. And I want a, sl a faster one. We'll go to two second vortex and a sound. Ooh, let's do ah, breaking glass. Oh, you won't get to hear it here. I'll plug in the sound because this is vital. Vital for the A star. Let's see if that works. Oh, it didn't even come through. One more time. Ready? Nothing. Oh, I did, forgot to do. Ah, there we go. That'll wake him up. All right, so that's the basic idea. The one thing I want to, to mention is you, if you have something you really love, you could, of course, click Apply to All Slides up here, and then you'll get that same horrible transition on every single slide. And now when I start it, you'll see every time. Oh, my God, every time. You could have it whisper, A hey, star. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> Try that out. Uh, okay, so I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to say no sound. Do they have an A star? That'd be cool. A star. Oh, you can record one, other sound. Will it let me record? No, I'll have to find one. Okay, never mind. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna turn off the sounds, no sound, uh, and apply that to all slides. So at least now we won't have the sound. Okay, so that's, that's the basics of transitions. Any questions about transitions? No. All right, so the next thing I was gonna mention is related to transitions, which are the animations. And again, I'm sorry if you guys all know this, you probably do, uh, but it's always worth thinking about it again. So let's say on the background, adverts are everywhere. I wanted to have it make this point graphically as well as up on the slide. So adverts are everywhere. I'm going to need more than just that one. I'm going to get one more image. Uh, lots of adverts. Let's see what we find. Uh, 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 uh. Whoa. Dodgy. Uh, I don't know what to say about this. Let's try. Um, uh, adverts, let's put just adverts. Nah, nah, nah. Nah. All right, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna take a random image just because I don't want to take up your time. So let's say we did get some more examples with adverts everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna put, believe it or not, one last one. Ah, that's a nice one. With the Christmas truck and everything. It's got it all. Okay, so that'll go in here. Adverts are everywhere. Mm. All right, so now we have some adverts, but of course, if I were to start my presentation again, I think I still have my stupid thing yet, so boom, advert. Ah. So background is that adverts are everywhere. It's okay, but it's a little, it lacks. So I would now, I'm going to make these adverts appear. Dun, da, da, da. So let's say we wanted this one. We'll start with this one. Let's say we wanted this guy to come driving in because he has a truck there. It'll kind of match the look. First, let me zoom in a bit more, sorry. Uh, I mentioned the notes down here. I tend not to use the notes, so you could just actually hide them, get a little more space. Uh, so here we go. We want this guy to drive in. It's pretty straightforward. You just click on animations up here in the menus, little area, animations, boom, animations. And you could choose again, how do you want him to come in? You want to do an entrance effect. You could choose different kinds of effects in general. Entrance effects are the ones you want to play with. So entrance effect, uh, 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 let's say, I'm gonna have him drive in. Oh, fly in, that's even better. Boom, that's pretty good. So now he flew in. Now the thing is, he of course flew in the wrong way. He came from the bottom. So what you wanna do is up here, there's this really poorly labeled and named thing that says reorder. It actually is the master key to getting animations right. You wanna click that and you'll get this box here. And this box lets you do everything. So this animation is gonna come in, it's picture five, and within that animation, you can now say, ah, again, our effect option. So we want it to come in from left. That's much better. And we don't want it to dim. We don't want a sound. We could do a little sound, a horn sound. That would be kind of cool. Let's see what that does. Uh, and timing-wise, this is going to get annoying. 
timing-wise, you want it to actually come in. Now this gets a little weird. If you say after previous, it means that if it's the first thing, it means as soon as, the, as soon as it's done appearing, that will come in. If you say with previous, sort of as it's appearing, this will start as well. It's a small point. You can play with that. But I'll say after previous. I want it to come in very fast, no delay whatsoever, and just make it happen. Uh, so that's now, I think, that should work. Let's give it a go. Boom. Perfect. It's brilliant. <laughs> All right. The horn is cheesy, so we can get rid of the horn. But again, I'm just using this as an example. So where were we? Effect options. This time, no horn. How about a fly in? Whoa. All right. So uh, now we can do the same thing for these guys. This guy, we want, again, let's say we want to make him come in. And that's, we'll do a peek in. That's my favorite. I love peek in. Peek in. Peek in duck. I should make a peek in duck. Okay. So we'll do one more peek in on this guy. So now here we go. We got all of them coming in. Uh, this guy, or gal, don't need to be sexist. This guy, I want him to appear, let's say, from the left. Boom. And that's about it. Timing wise, it gets interesting. I'm going to have him not on click, of course, but as soon as the first, as soon as the truck is done coming in, as soon as the Coke thing, then he comes in. So I'm going to say after previous. And for this one up here, I want to do again, this one I'm going to have after previous. I'm going to have it very fast. And I'm going to have it this, yeah, from bottom. All right, let's see if that works. One quick try. I have to turn off the shred transition, but I won't. Ooh, adverts are everywhere. Now it's starting to feel like a nice kind of presentation that you've spent some time thinking about. Uh, any questions about that yet? It's pretty straightforward. You could just play around with it. If you wanted to change the order of things, you could just drag them. You could use these little arrows here to move them up or down. Or if you want to delete the animation, you could do that. Um, I'll just, one thing I want to demonstrate is if I did select, this is weird. This is a new thing in PowerPoint. If I select that, I'm actually not given any choices because I've technically not selected the animation. It's this thing that is the animation. So that's worth keeping in mind. It's a new thing they've done stupidly. Uh, but if I want to say, let's say this guy, I want him to this time appear. Boop. I want to say, just to show you what it's like with previous, because it's kind of a nice effect as well. And the same here, this animation, I want to also be with previous. Boom. All right, now you'll see that they all will come in sort of together. Ooh, adverts are everywhere. All right, it's looking pretty good. Any questions about that? No? All right. So that's, again, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time going through the basics of PowerPoint, but I think those are kind of the only things that you're going to need. With that, you could do a lot of damage. Let's leave it there. Um, anything else about these guys? Animations. There's lots of other things you can do. You can change. You can, for most of them, again, you, you can actually do some of this up here in the menu bar. So like if I did want this guy, sorry, again, this guy. Now he is with previous. You could also change these kinds of things up here. He has other options from bottom, from left. Anyway. All right, any questions about animations? It's pretty straightforward. The only thing I wanted to add to that is text, because animating text is a bit different, and it's kind of cooler. Um, let me put, I have to add something here. Adverts are everywhere, and we all love them. Uh, whoop. Well, let's see. They're scary to kids. I don't know what we're going to say. Something like that. Move this bus out of the way a bit. Shrink him down a bit. All right. Uh, adverts are dangerous. Dangerous. All right. So now, now when I, it's the same logic here, by the way. So I've selected the text by cl clicking this box. And now I want to animate it. And I'm going to have it animate by, oh, I don't know. I like whip. Actually, whip is too complicated. I won't do whip. Let's say, uh, uh, again, it doesn't really matter. I'll use my peek in. I love my peek in. Okay, so there we go. Adverts are everywhere. Now, the thing that you may have noticed, it's PowerPoint is pretty smart. It knows that that's text, and so it knows that you probably want to animate it a bit differently. So I'll show you. You probably noticed when it did it, but I'll just show you what it decided to do for me. Here we go. Whoop. Now, it, it by default is wait for click, so it's waiting for me to click or spacebar. Spacebar and click are the same. Adverts are everywhere, and we all love them, scared kids, but you know, they're also dangerous. Maybe that's how you want to do your presentation. But maybe you want to build drama. Adverts are everywhere, then maybe you want to say, and we all love them, but they're scared of kids. So you can actually go in there. It's actually created a little placeholder. And if you click this arrow here, you can see everything within it. Boom. 
So adverts are everywhere, kids love them, scary kids. And you'll see that each of these actually is going to be, like this guy is with previous. It by default has set them all so that anything that's subcategory, it's the main category, will be a with previous. Yeah. But if you want to build the drama, you can make this be on click as well. Boom. Or you could actually, what I like to do often is after previous. If you want this to be very fancy, you could even add a slight delay. So you could try to keep up with it. So you don't have to keep clicking the button to move forward. And same here. I'm going to say for this guy, I want him to do after previous, but give me a second to say, and we all love it. All right. Does that make sense? So let me just show you what that looks like. So now it still is going to wait for the space bar for the first thing. And now, which is stupid, it really shouldn't wait for the space bar, but I haven't changed that. Habits are everywhere, you know, and we all love them. I'm not doing space bar, but they're kind of scary to kids. So by doing that, you can add the delay and it will sort of go ahead for you. Probably more than enough on animations. Everyone feel happy with animations? Should we move on to something else? Yeah, okay. Animations, okay, so you get the idea. You could do a lot of good stuff with that, though. I'd, I'd like to see this year more dynamic presentations. Again, it doesn't matter. I'm not actually, I think this year I'm not marking anyone, but I may come along just for fun because I like to hear. But anyway, uh, I think. In the only critique I would have of past presentations is they all tend to be very static. There's not a lot of kind of, some people did actually add nice graphics and things on the edges and add some designs. You know, even if it's subtle, you don't have to go all out. It doesn't have to look techno kid, but you may want to just put like some kind of cool brain thing on the bottom if you're doing brain stuff or if it's about caring and carers and intellectual disabilities, you maybe you want to have some something. Try to do something, but very few people actually use animations and dynamic stuff, and I think it will help separate you from the crowd. Uh, look at that crowd out there. Okay, so uh, next up, that was animations. Next thing I was going to talk about is two-screen mode. Again, I don't know if you care about it or not. I think, I'm 90% sure that you'll be making your presentation on a Macintosh computer, and... Uh, because I have such a weird resolution, anyway, it doesn't matter. System preferences lets you set up the screens, displays. You don't really have to know this. If you don't want to do two screen mode, ignore this. But if you do, listen. And the only other thing I should add is if you, if you don't want to do two screen mode, that's fine. But beware because the person ahead of you may have put it in two screen mode. So you have to know how to get it back to normal. So keep that in mind. So you, if you need to get, do anything, you want to go to System Preferences. Within System Preferences, I went into Displays. Within Displays, you can do all kinds of stuff. But for me, what I wanted to show you is for the arrange, arrangement of the displays. Right now, it's set to Mirror Displays. So down here, I'm going to try to turn it. This is always a bit risky. Eh, it doesn't matter. It basically, it's the same as that because <laughs> it's mirroring. So I see the same on both screens. Now, I over here have the menu bar, and you guys have the second screen which currently is nothing really, which is all fine. Now, the cool thing is if I were to start my slideshow again, I believe, I don't even know if it's worth telling you guys about this, but let me see, let me go back to mirroring for a second, just a second, boom. Each time gets a little bit smarter and a little bit stupider. So, by the way, this means that there's an animation transition kind of thing happening. Uh, so, in PowerPoint, under Slideshow, you can do, I think, set up Slideshow, boom! And now you can tell it whether you want it to play around with the screen. See, so now it, it lets me say which one should the audience see and which one should I see. In this case, again, since they're mirrored, it doesn't make any difference. So I'll just click here and say OK. I'll turn off mirroring and show you what happens now. So if I turn off mirror PowerPoint, you guys don't see it, but I see it down here, PowerPoint. Now, I'm going to say set up screen. I'm going to click that screen button again. And this time, ooh, I really should. Will it let me move this? Oh, it will. Look at that. Now I'm going to say, okay, where's the audience looking? Well, this is my menu bar, which is on my laptop, which is good. And I want the audience to see this screen up here, which is how it's kind of set. So now when I play my animation, you guys will see. The animation can't show you two screen mode. I think it's because it may be that I have to quit PowerPoint before it lets me do it. I think I do. I can't quit though. I'll lose my beautiful presentation. Anyway, the reason if you're interested in this two screen mode, if I should keep going or should we just skip two screen mode? Skip two screen mode. Yay. Okay, we'll skip two screen mode. Okay, back to normal then. Sorry. Sorry about that. Real stuff now. Skipping two screen mode. Let's go back to the presentation. And I think, 
I'm going to skip printing as well because I don't think anyone cares about printing. So I think we've covered everything here. We talked about outlines, make quick outlines of the presentation, design templates or themes as they now call them to make them all have the same look and feel, bubbly Facebook, the master slides, how you can use it to put page numbers. I didn't show that, but it's the same idea. You can put page numbers. Transitions, animations, two screen presentations, printing, reduced file size, uh, that doesn't matter. Demo, okay, so we covered all that. Next is preparing your presentation. So that was the nuts and bolts of PowerPoint. Now, how to make a presentation. The main thing I would say is to tell a story, even if it's not the whole story, right? So what's the big issue? That's where you're gonna have to kind of make some choices. So you don't wanna to try to present your whole thesis in a presentation. You wanna present what you think is the most interesting line to follow, right? So don't follow all the variables, unless that's the most interesting thing. Try to pick and choose carefully. You wanna make an interesting, engaging kind of story. Uh, it's basically how would you want to talk about it at a party if you only had five minutes and someone said, so what was your thesis about? You could say, well, you know how adverts are kind of everywhere and nowadays you see billboards, but now they're also on Facebook and I was looking at how advertising on Facebook works. And so what I did was blah, blah, blah. Right? So that's kind of what you want to do. Even if you also look to see if personality variables affected it, maybe you did a big five, maybe you did an impulsivity scale, you did all these other things. If none of that is really that relevant to the big story, don't even mention it in your presentation. Or you could maybe mention it, we looked at these covariates, but none of them were actually relevant, so I won't mention them anymore. Yeah? So you have to kind of pick one story and kind of tell the story as clearly as you can. Try to kind of keep a consistent storyline. Try to make build some drama. I'll talk about that in a second. And again, consistency of look, tone, and pacing is kind of important as well. So slide advice. These are, again, nuts and bolts. Try to use graphics as much as you can. Use big fonts. It's my biggest complaint, and I always mark people down. Not really, but um, anyway, use big fonts. It's really annoying if you're sitting at the back of the room or even if you're at the front of the room and you can't read. So basically, never use any font size smaller than 24 point. I don't think I follow all this advice here. Let me just see. What's this one? 20 point. Oh, my God, how embarrassing for me. This one's 24. 20 point you maybe could get away with on this thing, but in general, try to use at least 24. Um, big fonts. Include page numbers if you can. Make a note of that. Down in the corner, I, again, I didn't follow. Oh, I did. Page eight. Because as the person, like myself, if I'm listening to you and I remember I wanted to ask you something, it's much easier for me to write slide eight, ask about that graph, than to write, you know, whatever. So anyway, it'd be nice if you had a title on every slide as well, background methods, something that was easy to identify, you know, previous research. So slide number, title on the slide. Um, Use quality or no clip art if you can. I don't know if any of you care, but that's clip art. It's, you know, you can always, in PowerPoint, you saw I was dragging pictures over from, uh, from Google. You could always just do insert photo. They have kind of clip arts that you can use. There was a time, a couple, I guess about four years ago, where every student presentation had tons of clip art. Uh, and some of the clip art nowadays is not, not that bad. And it's a nice place to go looking if you want stuff. The main advantage of clip art is that you can uh, insert things and... I think that they tend to be nowadays kind of vector, not pixels, if that matters to anyone. So nice dog. The clip art is getting much better. So the cool thing about it nowadays is that they put pretty high res images in there. So that dog, even if I scale him up huge, he'll still be dogified. Look at that. Wow. Wow. That has to go in our other presentation. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Copy. I'm going to put him in here. Where does he go? Here. Oh, doggy. All right. And of course, you could have him come in animated. I'm not going to do it. So anyway, clip art, I, even though I say don't use clip art, nowadays, actually, it's getting better. It used to be only these kind of very pixelated, clunky kinds of things. Nowadays, it's quite a bit better. But in general, see what you can do. Uh, limit your text. Use short sentences and bullets. Uh, you don't need to say participants were asked to press spacebar. You could just say participants press spacebar or spacebar or something like that. You could say participants were asked to use the spacebar, whatever it is. Every year I have someone who puts up a methods and it's basically obvious they just copied it from their thesis and pasted it in its paragraph. So there shouldn't even be any sentences, I would say. It's a bit of a contentious issue. Uh, and again, I'm a bullet points kind of guy. I like bullet points, but see what you can do to try to either at least go to bullets or short sentences, but definitely do not have any paragraphs in your presentation. Um, references, again, you know, should you have references? You probably should just to science it up a bit, make it look like you actually are saying something. Some people say they're good. This is how I personally like to do them. That's not a real reference. Uh, but yeah, if you want to put a reference there, please don't put it in the text. That's really annoying. 
you know, you have the full reference. It's also kind of annoying to me if you have the full reference down here and you take up like a third of the slide. If you put it too tiny, it's kind of annoying. So in general, if you want to put a reference, again, it's a nice idea. You could put sort of the author, maybe an et al, if it's multiple, the year, the title, and the journal article. Uh, sorry, the journal title as well. Just because most people like myself, we know, if I were to look at this, okay, I not, I've heard of that guy, I think once. That's a reputable journal. That's what it was about. Okay, good enough. I don't really care if it was volume three, issue, blah, blah, blah. So it's important, I think, just to put the author, a bit of the title, and something about the journal. Does that make sense? That's kind of the only important bits, really, of it. Spell check. Again, every year it's amazing to me that there's misspelled words throughout a presentation. Uh, oh, yeah, the leading text to the bottom. I don't know if any of you care about it, but I would recommend it. It's something that I do, um, which is down here. What about graphs? So um, the way I have this particular slide set up is that I, you know, I made the slide, I put what about graphs, and then I had it be an animation on mouse click, you know, appear or peek in, something like that, like we just saw. So that, you know, add leading text to the bottom, you do a space bar, and if you set it up this way, you say, but that's all fine, but then what about graphs? And you could have it, you don't have to have it animated, it could just be at the bottom of the slide. It's meant to be something to aim the listener into what you're about to talk next, but more importantly, it's to remind you where you're going next. You'll be surprised when you're doing a presentation under pressure, you totally forget what your next slide is, and that's a bit awkward. So it's nice to know what your next slide is, and you can then kind of lead into it. So all that's fine, but you may be thinking, what about graphs? Well, in fact, graphs, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's nice to have it at the bottom. It's up to you. So graph advice, this is, this is important stuff as well. Be sure that your labels are big. For some reason, Excel, stupidly, and SPSS is even worse, it puts at these tiny, tiny fonts that are useless, unreadable, and also annoyingly wasteful, because there's no reason that well, first of all, the range, play around with the range. You don't want to show, for some reason, again, Excel likes to use nice numbers in its book, but there's really no reason to be going up to four in this example. You know, you could have stopped at three, probably, unless four has a meaning, like if it's, you know, the highest rating they could give, maybe you do want to put four. Anyway, play around with the scale, but most importantly, play around with the font sizes. Again, if you're in the audience and if you have bad vision like I do, um, then you want to be able to easily see it. You don't want to be kind of squinting and struggling to read what these numbers are, right? So be sure to use big labels. Actually, here I don't even have labels. I should have had the name. Uh, so you should have big text, big digits, big scales, and big labels, yeah? Don't put up a graph that doesn't have a label, like I've done here. It should really say intensity and rating or something, whatever those things are, yeah? Now, when you have a graph, what do you do with it? So often what happens is someone will put it up and say, and here are the results. You could see that something cool happened. And I can't see that. I don't even know what you're talking about if you say that. What you really need to do is this. You need to, whenever you put up a graph, you should always introduce the axes. So you should say, on the x-axis, we have face load. That's kind of how many faces they had to hold in memory at once from low, just holding two faces in memory up to high, six faces in memory. So that was the difficult thing. They had to hold a lot of memory. And on the y-axis, we have D prime, which is the signal, whatever it is. You know, from low, meaning that they're actually very bad at it, to high, meaning they're very good at it, something like that. So that's what you need to do. You need to always introduce the axes, uh, say what they mean, try to give an intuitive feel for what they mean as well. You know, low being very easy and high being very difficult. Uh, and then you should also say what the different symbols are. And in solid symbols, you'll see I've plotted upright famous faces. So this was like the Marilyn Monroe and presidents and people like that. And here, open symbols are unfamiliar novel faces. And then you should tell people what you want them to see. And you can see that as people had to hold more faces in memory at once, their performance got worse, but actually it didn't get as bad for famous faces or something like that. Yeah? Does that make sense? So it's called walking through a graph. And you want to be sure to walk your audience through the graph. So you start with the axes, give a feel for the ends, then explain the symbols, and then explain what you want people to see. Make sense? All right. More on graphs later. Getting ready. Okay, so boop, boop. presenting before the day. Yeah, so once you've made your presentation, you've used your outlines, you've done your animations, you put your graphs in, graphics, you've made big fonts and all that, you should then go word hunting and try to kill off any extra words. This is one of these weirdly self-referential self slides. Look for ways to group things by theme or by topic or by research or by finding. Find ways to group by theme, topic. So this is kind of my advice. Don't have these long sentences, especially if, if it is kind of easier this way. Now, when you're presenting this, 
you could say. And of course, it's important to go through and try to find nice ways to group things. For instance, you may want to group them by theme, topic, researcher. So you could say all of that, but you don't want to have it all on the slide. Does that make sense? Uh, practice your presentation. Practice it a bunch if you can. Record it or video it. There's lots of different ways you could do it. Uh, listen for places where you say, ah, uh, um, I, I still do that all the time, but you'll be amazed how often you say ah uh, and um, and if you become aware of it, it'll, it'll make it horrible when you're doing your presentation. Now, uh, but anyway, try to work on getting rid of those ah uh, and ums. If you can find some na naive friends, you can have, have them ask questions. You know, I want you to listen to my presentation. It'll only take you eight minutes, but during it, I want you to really think of any hard questions you can do. It's much easier to have friends ask you hard questions a few days in advance than on the day. Time your presentation, this is a difficult one. Uh, sometimes when people are nervous, they speed up and they talk faster. That's the more common thing. Uh, when you get nervous, you tend to talk much quicker. And so you need to think about it. Other people, if they get nervous, they slow down a lot. They kind of look at the slides a bit. And then you want to kind of find ways to group by things like the, anyway. So you have to be aware of that and try to kind of get it under control. Uh, memorize, if possible, what you're going to say. Try not to memorize long sentences. But the one, this was advice that my undergrad supervisor gave me, which was quite good, is that you tend to be most nervous for the first 30 seconds of the presentation as you're kind of looking at the audience and you're kind of feeling, oh my God, it's actually happening. This is it. Oh my God, this is actually it. Uh, so for the first 30 seconds, the best thing you can do is really memorize at least the first 30 seconds. You know, hi, I'm James. I'm going to talk about my undergrad project, which I did in conjunction with Paul Downing, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So try to memorize that exact thing that you're going to say for your first slide or two. Even if you're going to have notes, try to memorize at least that much. Any questions about that? No? On the day, on the day, on the day, dress appropriately. Again, it's up to you entirely how you want to dress, but it is difficult, again, as an audience member to overlook if one person is doing a presentation and they're dressed kind of nice and the next person is just wearing cut-off jeans and a t-shirt and kind of looks like they just rolled out of bed. We, we will overlook that, uh, but you're creating an uphill battle for yourself. That's just the way humans is. I like this. Uh, do not over rely on notes. If you have notes, that's fine. Try not to look down at them. Again, this is stuff you guys have all figured out from pops and life in general. Try to speak comfortably and clearly. Ah, laser pointer, laser pointer, laser pointer advice, laser pointer advice. So, laser pointer advice. This was something my PhD supervisor talked to me about. Laser pointer advice. So, laser pointers are lovely, and I think they'll be there on the day. You may just want to use this thing. It's a little awkward. Laser pointers are kind of fun. I think there'll be one there. If you use it on the day and you practice and you're all happy and everything, you may find that when you go to point, suddenly you're, late, you're doing this because you're a little nervous. And that just always happens. It's, you know, no matter how many times you've done a presentation, it happens. It happens more if you're farther away. So the farther you get, the more noticeable the little jitters are. Um, but it take, there are some things you could do to end that problem. So there's two main options, three options, let's say. So one of them is to, let's see, my supervisor, PhD supervisor, his advice was to hold it against your body, which takes out the background flutter, which is pretty good. That works nicely. That's one good option. Hold it with two hands against your body. That's even better. So that, I, overall, that's what I would recommend. Two hands against the body. So here you can see it looks a little bit awkward, but it's not, it's much nicer than this. The other thing I should have mentioned is you get in this whole um, giggle loop, if any of you watch coupling, it's kind of that thing. Uh, you get this kind of nonlinear feedback thing where you'll notice that it's moving a little bit. You'll think, oh my God, it's moving. They all think I'm nervous. I am kind of nervous, in fact. And it starts moving even more. Oh my God, now it's getting worse. And you, it, it, does, it just gets this weird thing going where you'll find the more you try to keep it still, the more it'll start moving. And that gets weird too. So laser pointers are a, a mixed blessing. But yeah, I would say against your body is probably good. This doesn't look too awkward. A little bit Napoleon, but not so bad. Uh, so yeah, one hand against the body is pretty good. That works well. The other thing you could do is you could go for the casual look, which is some another way around it. So laser pointer advice. You know, you got to think about how you laser. So you could kind of do that and act as if you're kind of casually, nonchalantly pointing, which is fine. But again, even if you have it practiced on the day, you may find that you're kind of like this. Well, you know, you know, and that's kind of useless. <laughs> so what you, I, I think one hand against the body works pretty well. Any questions about laser pointers? Don't shine them in the eyes of the audience. Um, oh yeah, use pauses. Build drama. Again, it's up to you how you want to do that. Uh, if you want to do it or not, it might seem a bit over the top, but you could do it sometimes. You know, so we wondered why. And what we did was, you know, it's not too weird if you do that, right? So we wondered why, so what we did is that doesn't work. So try to use some amount of pauses. You, again, when you're practicing it, try to consciously think where it is you're going to pause, because it will make it more interesting. Look around, make eye contact, see humans out there if you want to. Again, it's up to you. 
on the day, it's not a big deal. Uh, be enthusiastic. Enthusiasm gets you 90% of the way out. Something. But be excited about it. It's always kind of a bummer if someone comes and they talk about it like apologetically and kind of boring. And so they made us go and collect data on that and we kind of did this. And you know, you don't want that. You want so we we decided to collect data on this. Uh, enthusiasm. 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 <laughs> uh, any questions about that stuff on the day? Oh, yes, sir. Ooh. To point to turn up here, laser like that. Yeah, you could do that if you want. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Even better. I'm never brave enough to leave this the comfort of my little harbor over here. I just can't do it. But but yeah, if you if you want to, the only thing is that it's a little awkward if the light is in your eyes. And that in most of these rooms, it does kind of work that way. You could go to the side. There are advice that oh, I forget now how it goes. There's if you're making a point that's in a rational point, you want to be standing on one side of the screen. If it's an emotional point, it's on the other. There's actual, there's there's a book, uh, well, if anyone cares, I'll post a link to it on Blackboard where I post this, but there is a book that goes through all this other kind of NLP approaches to presenting and what to say, how to say, which hand you're supposed to use if you're trying to get into the subconscious. Most of it is just BS. But anyway, yeah, going around to the board is fine. It looks kind of exciting, especially if you, if you had the graph, let's say you want to walk through the graph. So you know, here on the x-axis we have that, that's kind of cool. The you know, face load going from easy to hard, that's kind of cool. So yeah, feel free to approach the board if you will. Anything else? Any other questions about that slide? Lasers, enthusiasms, Ah, psych-specific stuff. Okay, so uh, be sure, these are just points over the years. Every year I add a new one to here. So this is over the last 10 years, I guess now, these are what I've collected. So. In your introduction, be sure to have the title, what your thing is. And don't say third year presentation as the title of your thing. Uh, in fact, in your USB stick, in your PowerPoint file name, also don't just say third year presentation. I just ran some third year presentations with some of you, Dragon's Den, and everyone's was called Dragon Den Presentation. So anyway, give it some name. Give it, you know, Intrilligator dissertation or dissertation presentation intrilligator blah, blah blah or something some name anyway but especially the title slide you know our I won't go over there but our, our thing it should have a nice title it should have your name very clearly it should have your PS blah 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 very clearly it's also nice to put the name of your supervisor I always find it weird when these students are talking and they never mention oh yeah and we did this with Paul Mullins or we did it with you know I can't think of I just keep thinking of those two Pauls for some reason uh, I think last year I heard a bunch of presentations from their students anyway. Uh, Debbie, did it with Debbie Mills, professor, you know, whoever. Put who your supervisor was on there. Again, it doesn't matter, but it just looks a little bit weird for you not to give them any credit, even if they don't deserve it. Uh, and also your collaborators, you could say, the, you know, again, you don't have to name, you don't have to read the slide. I did this work with, you know, Buddy Hopkins, whoever it is. You don't have to read their names, but you could put your name, the title of your thing, your name, your supervisor's name, and maybe underneath a little asterisk, you know, work thanks to my collaborators, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, short, oh yeah, for your introduction in general, short, but try to create some mystery or drama, some relevance, you know. So lots of people who volunteer with uh, people with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, end up burning out. Why is that? That's the question we wanted to look at, right? So you want to begin with like big drama, mystery, something that pulls the audience in to, under to make them want to hear more, right? So don't just, you know, the coping strategies of people working with people with uh, a systematic approach or something, you know, blah, boring, who cares? Uh, but even if that's going to be the title, you can then still begin with your short mystery drama. Why do people who volunteer burn out after six months? That's what we were looking at. So you can kind of give the colloquial explanation of what you were looking at as well. Any questions about that? Methods, be sure to use pictures wherever you can. It took so... So often I heard, this was again years ago, but there were a lot of people doing research on the attentional blink. Raise if you know about the attentional blink, I'm just kind of curious, it's still around. Hi. Uh, and so often they would try to explain it without a single picture. It's like, oh my God, it, it, it is a graphic. So here, this is a standard way if you're gonna do something, again, I don't know if any of you are computery based people, but try to use some kind of graphics, even if it's like baby, a picture of a baby with, you know, do we give them stuffed animals to play with or puppets to play with, you know, have pictures, lots of pictures. Um, if you can have a demo, that's lovely. If any of you did work with babies and you have any videos you could show, wow, you immediately jump up half a grade. Yes, ma'am. Well done. 
Ah. Uh. No, that's brilliant. Yeah, physical demonstrations are great. If you have something you can pass around to the audience, that immediately engenders engagement, and that works well as well. Um, if you weren't allowed to use pictures or videos of babies, you could take pictures from the internet and say, you know, these are these aren't the actual babies we use. These are other babies, but this is what they did. And you know, you could have a picture of the baby. And you could have a doll and a puppet, and you could say, you know, the baby looks at the doll and puppet here. This is the puppet. You know, here's the doll. Pass it around, and whatever you can do to kind of make it engaging and and give the audience a sense of what it was like to be the baby in the experiment or to be, you know, watching the baby in the experiment. Examples are always good. Examples, demos. Skip the details. Oh my god. So many times I've seen slides where the methods and they go through like there's 30 bullet points of everything. You know, the baby saw the doll for 6.2 seconds. We then took the doll away for 1.8 seconds. You know, we then watched them. For, and again, if that is relevant, then that's fine. If, if you you know, measured how long they needed it, then you do want to say we measured it for, if it was 10, but if it's not relevant, don't say it, right? So I've seen other studies where they've done work with drugs and we gave them 6.2 milli ounces of blah, blah, per kilogram of body weight. And we let this inject for three years. It doesn't matter. We gave them the drug, you know, asterisk, and maybe down below you could say what it was. So don't put, you don't need to put all the details on your slides. Okay, just what you need to put there to tell the story you're choosing to tell. All right, same for any questions? Results, results, no. Results, be sure to use graphs. Again, I've seen this exact, not literally this exact data, but I, I, if this were the data, I've seen other people present a table. Don't put a table. I probably shouldn't say that, but no matter what, do not put a table of your results up there. I bet many of you were gonna put a table. Don't put a table, if, unless it makes sense, but almost, I've never seen a table that didn't make more sense as a graph or a graph table combination thing, but try to put a graph. Yes? Is, yeah, you have counts or something. I don't know, what are you getting at? What did you do? You did what? Backward regressions. Wow, how cool. Statistical or psychological regressions? I mean, were you having people regress back to the womb? <laughs> you know, now imagine. It wasn't that kind of regression. Mathematical regressions. You poor thing. Who is your supervisor? <laughs> oh, my God. No, okay, that's cool. That's fine. You must have data, though, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. But you can, you can, you can create a graphic of that, no? You could color code it, at least, so anything that was... If, if you're going to do a table, do something to, so that someone like me who doesn't look at numbers, numbers, uh, doesn't have to look at the numbers. So if you can have pictures, you know, so if it is a table of numbers, you can at least color the cells. Spend at least the time to color your table so that, you know, the big numbers are red and the little numbers are, you know, you could kind of use a rainbow color scheme, something like that. Something so, I mean, partly it's just the impression. You don't want the audience to think you just copy and pasted a table the night before and you're done. So something to, to say that you've spent some time on it. So again, it's a bit stupid, but it makes a difference. Right? And if you could find any way to graph it, that would be great. Yes, sir? Again, it kind of depends what story you're trying to tell. It, you, it's nice to have some f values and p values if it's important. Like if, it, if your point is it worked or it didn't work, then you do want to show it worked or didn't work by having an f and a p there. Um, if you have one or two of them, that's fine. If it turns out you need you have like five different conditions and it's important that you include all five conditions and some worked and some didn't work, it could get a bit messy and maybe you then want to have a color scheme or asterisks, you know, so a single asterisk means that it's significant at the 0.05, double asterisk 0.01, triple asterisk less than 0.001 or something like that. But yeah, if you can include some F's and P's, it does science it up. <laughs> Any other questions about results-y things? And be sure to walk through them, you know, here are our results. Next slide. I've seen lots of presentations where people do that, and you really should explain what your results showed. Uh, and then in the discussion, if you have a discussion side, you want to remind them of why you did what you did and what you found. So remember, we were looking to see whether different forms of regression lead to different analyses. And to do that, we looked at this. What we found, interestingly, was blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's a bit stupid because it's only 10 minutes, but you want to, again, you want, once you've gone to the details and the results, you then want to come back to the big picture. So our big question was this, 
and here's what we found. Thank you very much. Something like that. What it means, implications, limitations. You know, don't spend, you don't need to have a whole slide, especially if the limitations, so many times I've seen the limitations are we only used a sample of Bangor undergrads, so we can't generalize the general population. We kind of, we all know that. We're all grown ups, we're all psychologists. Uh, that's fine if it's relevant to your study, right? So if it is something, if you were looking at how people deal, uh, let's say again with kids and puppets or something like that, you know, limitation is we used a small sample size and it was only in upper middle class families. That's kind of relevant, but if it's that, you know, if, if you found something actually kind of important and you think it's generalizable, it may be, you know, you could say limited limited sample size, but again, that's kind of obvious. Try to think of the, the more interesting limitations and talk about those. You could put, you know, of course we have limitations like sample size, etc. You could have a list, you know, small sample size, limited number of people, blah, blah, blah. You know, but we had some limitations, but the most important limitation we found was that we only were able to do the program for two weeks. You know, so focus again on the most important limitation. Don't spend a lot of time talking about things that are kind of true for everyone study undergrad studies. <clears throat> All right. Future work, where am I to go with this? You know, yes, babies like puppets. It turns out that's great. What I really want to find out in the future is now this is where you have to lie a bit. Um, and it's not much of a lie, but you know, what I'd like to find out in the future is whether this kind of puppet therapy could be done by parents, because I think that would be revolutionary if we could find a way to get parents doing it so we don't have to go in ourselves and do the puppet therapy. That would be really interesting. I think that's an important uh, direction for future research. You could kind of make it sound like that's what you are going to do. You're applying to ESRC and granting agencies and next year with your master's. But actually, you couldn't care less about these stupid puppets. You never want to see them again. That's fine. You want to create the impression that you are passionate about this and this is your life work. You know, once we sort out how to get parents playing with the puppets, then it's dogs and puppets. After that, it's, you know, politicians and puppets. We will end the Middle East crisis. You know, I see my PhD, you know, something like that. You want to make it sound like that is where you're going. Right? Even if it's not where you're going, that's fine. It's where the work could go. And you don't have to say it's you who's going to do it, but you could kind of allude to that. Where I think it would be interesting to see is puppets and politicians. Have they tried that? That would be cool. Ah. <laughs> um, future work. Uh, oh, my God. Ah, the irony. James saying arrive early. Arrive early! <laughs> uh, if you, again, it's not that important, but you should at least, if you can, get into the room and practice presentation, even if it's just the first few slides, to get a sense. Because every room is a little different. Like... Sometimes it's horrible where the podium is. It's kind of, it means that you have to be like right almost in the light. So anyway, go there and just practice for a minute if you can, even if it's just, you know, 15 minutes before. Uh, AV equipment, again, you should know how to play with the lights. Probably you won't have to mess with that. Mobile phone off. I've heard one or two where the phone goes off in the presentation. It's a little awkward. Tell the story. Next steps, where you're going to go next. Uh, that's not that relevant. That, not that relevant for this thing. Oh my god, this is funny. So yeah, don't place plants in the audience. So if you notice that you're in the same session with your friend, you know, so you and he or she are going to be in the same group. Oh, isn't that great? You're both presenting to Christoph Klein. Um, don't get the idea. I have an idea. Why don't you ask me a really hard question before anyone else can and make it long and I'll answer it. And I'll seem really smart and I'll do the same for you. I've actually seen this happen one year where so someone did this thing and someone in the back quickly put up her hand and she asked this really complicated statistical question and oh that's an interesting question. I actually have a slide on that and she gave this long answer and it was kind of and then it was even weirder when five minutes later her friend presented and she asked the exact same kind of obvious setup. So don't try to place a plant of someone to ask you an easier or hard question. Uh, backups. Oh yeah. So extra slides are nice. So if you know that when you presented it to your friends, everyone asked about X, Y, or Z, and you decide that you don't have time to talk about it, but they probably will ask that same question. If you have another slide at the end of your slide, one or two slides of more things, you could say, oh, that's a great question. Actually, here are the results for that analysis. That looks really cool. It may not work. I've seen some people where they have 10 slides in their presentation, they have like 40 extra slides, and it, it's pretty cool, because almost any question they get asked, oh, actually, I have a slide here on that, boom, there it is. You know, so. You could have some backup slides if, if, if you find that people ask the same question again and again, and there's a nice slide that you could put to explain it, that would be great. Oh yeah, so uh, handouts again, it's up to you. Almost no one does them. I think every year one of my eight or ten people have a handout. It's fine if you want to do it. If there's some reason to do it, it might be nice if you, I don't know. anyway, handouts, I don't know. You could make them if you want, print out your PowerPoints and give them out. Here you go with a business card, but I don't, it's a little weird. Uh, it, but fine, you know, I like them. I, I like, I do keep the handouts. I have them on the gold plated. No, um, I do keep them though. Uh, and it, especially if it's something where you think people might want to take notes. So 
hard questions, feel free to say, I don't know, or that's an interesting question, I hadn't thought about that. You don't have to have the answer. Don't worry if you don't have the answer. I've never been to a talk where the person, well, I've been to some, but almost never does the person have an answer to every question. Feel free to say, oh, that's an interesting question. Also, if you aren't sure what the person is asking, either because of a language problem, like they have a heavy accent, like some American, wah, 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 wah. you can't understand what they're saying, feel free to say, I'm not quite sure I understood your question. Could you say it a different way? Or I think what you're asking is blah, blah, blah. Is that right? You know, so feel free to engage with the questioner. It's not like the Inquisition. They're not shooting a question expecting an immediate response. Pretend it's a conversation at a cocktail party dialogue. So, you know, they so what, what would happen with this? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. You mean if I were to do the same thing with puppies? Or are you saying that in what we did if we tried it differently? Or something like that. So feel free to interpret, re-ask, ask for more details, etc. And I guess the other thing is to end with a thank you. It's always weird when things just kind of peter out and the audience isn't sure when you're over. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. That's not my thank you, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, that's how you could end. So in the, in the future, it'll be interesting to see if blah, 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 blah. Thank you. Just give a little thank you at the end. All right? And I think that is the end. Thank you. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't have anything else. So that is the end. Thank you. I don't need a fancy thank you. I will put this and this incredibly rambly audio cast of this somewhere on Blackboard if you want to look at it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around for a few minutes. I'm sorry we ran a bit over, but all things considered, not so bad. Uh, good luck with it. I'm sure they'll be brilliant, and maybe I'll come and hear you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>